Hi, I'm Chris Edmonds of the Purposeful Culture Group. I'm here with my co-author, Mark Babbitt. Our new book is out. It's called Good Comes First. And we were thrilled to connect with Dov this morning on the Leadership and Loyalty podcast to talk about three things that might interest you. One of them is that work culture is vitally important. And if you compromise on the quality of your work culture, you get exactly what you deserve, which is crap. <laughs> A second key is that thinking like old white guys, okay, there's three old white guys on the screen in front of you, but the old boomer male syndrome philosophy of leadership and wanting to go back to normal now that the pandemic is starting to move past us, that'll kill you and it'll kill your business. And the last thing, you've heard of the great resignation. You've heard of the labor shortage and 48 million plus US workers voluntarily quitting their jobs in 2021. Listen to the show and we'll prove to you that there is no labor shortage at all. So stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. You have heard me and some of our guests speak about how the pandemic has changed the face of business, of leadership, and of culture that trying to get back to normal is not only foolish, it's ignorant, and it really sort of denies the gravity of the psychological impact the pandemic has had. So what are you, what are we going to do practically? What are we going to do about that? What if success moving forward means first and foremost doing good? If it's true that good comes first, how can today's leaders create an uncompromising company culture based on just that good well stay tuned because that's where we're going on today's next two episodes so as always we need your help in staying relevant so please get over to wherever you tune into the show do us a favor rate review subscribe to the show it helps us stay relevant and it gives us the feedback we need so we want to hear from you if you are a regular listener big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners, and we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. By the way, I know you're curious, so uh, let me know. Let, let me tell you. I'm Dove Barron. I'm your host, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. If you're curious to know more, simply go to DoveBaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. How important is doing good for others in business? Well, you might be surprised. Let's find out together because our guests for the next two episodes are Chris Edmonds and Mark Babbitt. They are the co-authors of a timely book called Good Comes First, How Today's Leaders Create an Uncompromising Company Culture. Chris Edmonds is a sought-after speaker. He's a best-selling author, highly regarded executive consultant, CEO, and founder of the Purpose Culture Group. He is the author of two best-selling books, The Culture Engine and the latest, which is Good Comes First. It was just released in 2021. Chris has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Smart Brief, People, People. He was, you know, he was the People's Most Handsome Men of the Year, I think it was. Yeah, oh. maybe. Uh, CNN, Fox 31, <laughs> NBC, and Fast Company. Chris is the co-author with Mark Babbitt. Mark Babbitt. Chris is the co-author with Mark Babbitt. Mark is a fellow Inc. Magazine top 100 leadership speaker. He is an author, blogger, culture architect, executive coach, and career mentor. He serves as president of Work IQ and CEO and founder of U-Turn. That's Y-O-U-T-E. 
E R N. He is in the, also an indie man speaker, in addition to being a best selling author of Good Comes First. Mark has co authored a book called A World Gone Social. Mark's advice and is available through Entrepreneur, CEO World Inc., New York, um, USA Today, Forbes, and many other publications. They are joining us today in this conversation to inspire some real talk about why employees are leaving their jobs by the millions. And spoiler alert, they do not believe it's because there's a labor shortage. So ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and help me to welcome author of Good Comes First, how today's leaders can create uncompromised company culture, Chris Edmonds and Mark Bennett. <laughs> that goes wild. Well, at least the three of us do. There you go. Look at all the underwear that's being thrown on the stage for you. <laughs> oh, I, I miss I miss that. I didn't really. Yeah, I don't have that special effect. I think I, people thought you were Tom Jones there, Mark. There you go. <laughs> Boy, we so just dated you. ourselves, even knowing who Tom Jones is. Oh. That's hey, hey, hey! Don't you talk? Don't <laughs> don't even say anything disparaging about Tom. Tom's my hero. There you go. Um, so, in the context of leadership development. I, it's a question I always like to start with. What is the most frustrating thing that seems glaringly obvious to you, but is ignored or dismissed by other people in leadership? You know, we're brought in, you, I, all three of us are brought in to solve the problems for companies and corporations. And oftentimes, it's not really the problem. So in the context of that, what is the most frustrating thing that seems glaring about leadership development that is ignored or missed for both of you? It might be different from each other. Let me jump in. It's it's interesting because the, the challenges that leaders have faced have not changed much in the last 50 years. And the beliefs that leaders have about what is going well and what is going not so well may not be, Dov, as you have said, very accurate. And so for, for, for me, the presenting problem is often the easiest that leaders think might be addressed. So they bring in a speaker, a trainer, a consultant, uh, and, and the reality is that if the work culture itself doesn't, isn't treating people in a civil fashion, God forbid, a respectful fashion, that's your root problem. And nothing is going to gain traction if you don't solve that respect issue first. So respect first. So from your point of view, everything else they're talking about is kind of moot. That's the main point. If we don't have respect, okay. What about you, Mark? What are you seeing? You've already touched on it, though. This this whole concept of a labor shortage that yeah. it's ridiculous. People, it's not like people don't need to work anymore. We we still have mortgages to pay and tuition to pay for, and and we're gonna sit in this state of denial and say, oh, people just don't want to work anymore. No, people don't want to work for you anymore. People don't work, want to work within your disrespectful, demeaning culture anymore. And over the last two years, we've had, had we've all had an opportunity, including leadership, to sit back and say, you know what? I kind of like this, not being a workaholic, not being on a train all the time, not being in a hotel all the time. I like my life better this way, and I'm not going to go back to the old normal despite your insistence that I do, I'm going to quit instead. And, and the whole concept of, oh, people just don't want to work anymore. They got lazy during the pandemic. No, they didn't get lazy. They got particular. And, and they're choosing not to work in a culture that doesn't fit their new lifestyle, their new normal. Really well said. And, you know, I think that when we look at that, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's not like everybody's bills went away. It's not, oh, well, you know, the pandemic killed everybody's bills. They, all my bills died in the pandemic. No, that's not how it works. So people do, but they, you know, one of the things I talked about is that in 2008, we had the crash. And I think that from 2008 until the pandemic, we were living in the hustle culture that was based on scarcity. Like, oh my God, you know, it could be another crash, but it get a lot of money and hoard it. And so people were killing themselves, as you said, working like workaholics and killing themselves. And then they got forced into not doing that by the pandemic. And people went into high anxiety at the idea of not being able to go to work 
you know, 80 hours or 100 hours a week. But it's not our natural state, and we broke that habit. And as you said, now we're coming back and we're going, hmm, I kind of like seeing my kids. <laughs> I kind of like like knowing I actually have children. It's not just a concept anymore. This yeah. is something that's very real. Oh, okay, I'm going to stay with that. So I think that the standards have changed, and I love that's what I love about the book, and that's what I love about what you guys are talking about, is that it's not just simply about doing good. Of course, it is about that, but it is also about understanding that that mindset, that scarcity and hustle has been shot in the foot. And I'm, and I'm glad to hear that. You know, I've always said that Gary Vaynerchuk is the high priest of hustle. Right? <laughs> and I love Gary. I've met him. He's good guys, you know, um, but that hustle culture, it's, it's got to stop. It's got to stop. So when you look at that, um, let's go back to the book. The book is titled Good Comes First. It's not called respect comes first. It's called good comes first. So tell us why good comes first. Well, the concept was one that, that both Mark and I have been working with senior leaders for years to help them realize that if they create an environment where people feel validated and respected for their ideas, their efforts, their contributions, they're going to stay with you. They're going to invest their brain cells in solving problems for you. So it's a very different, and let's maybe look at it as a, who's my internal customer? Who's my primary customer? And it's your employees. And if they don't experience good in the form of validation and respect day to day, then they're going to find it somewhere else. And yes, that hustle culture, I think, a very, very well stated, Dov, it caused people to feel not quite confident that maybe the grass could be greener on the other side. And the pandemic, through, through all of that concern, anxiety, maybe it generated a whole bunch more. But I think what are we at? 48 million U.S. workers voluntarily quit in 2021 and another 4.2 million quit in January. This whole realignment of here's what I stand for. Here's where I want to work. Here's who I want to work for has, has totally, totally changed. So the core of good comes first is having employees feel like they're important like they're part of a valued team, like they're doing meaningful work. And leaders are not going to do that, kind of hanging in the industrial age thinking or even the hustle age thinking. Yeah, I mean, the, the industrial age is, is you know, we, we our generation, you and, and the three of us, that's, you know, we're the old white men. That's, we're the leftovers of the industrial age. Wow. The hustle culture belongs to the millennials. Yeah. But certainly um, Gen Z, you know, um, they're not interested in that at all. They're not interested in, in the industrial age work mode or the millennial work mode. They're looking at it from a very different place. But you, we talked about this in a pre-chat before. And I said, the challenge is that if you're an old white man and you're in charge, you're like, yeah, you know what? It doesn't matter because I'm going to be out of here in five years. Or two. Or two. And I work for a company that's going to give me a couple million retirement bonus, you know, at least. And um, so, you know, I'm just going to slug them and I'm going to get the numbers up so that my bottom line is good. So the stocks are good. So that I get my, my kickback on the way out. Talk to us about that because there's, you know, one of the things I've said, and I said it to you before, is we all know that the people who should read this book are likely not to read it. Yeah. Right. So how do we get the message across to those clowns who are just hanging around for another couple of years and going, it's fine. So you make a, an excellent point. And I remember in our pre-chat, we talked about, you know, for 10, 15 years now, we've been telling old white guys not to lead like old white guys and it's not making a dent. And no. so we coined a phrase in good comes first, we call it boomer male syndrome. And and we go right after those leaders. And, and yes, talk about shooting yourself in the foot. I guess we did because the people, the very people we, we want to read the book were kind of pissing off by, by saying you're you're the one that needs to listen and you're not because you're looking, you're looking for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow as you retire in a few years. And 
And here's what we found. We can't tell old white guys to stop acting like old white guys. It does not work. And, and in fact, the, old, the only old white guys that change have gone through a divorce or they've lost a child or they've had a heart attack or maybe they lost somebody in the pandemic. And now they're sitting back going, just like we talked about just a few minutes ago, this hustle thing, this workaholic thing isn't working for me anymore. And, and my legacy doesn't make me feel very good right now. And so I'm going to change. I'm going to be one of the few old white guys who says, I am going to start inviting diversity. I'm going to build a different succession plan. I'm going to start actually enjoying my kids and maybe my grandkids and my fur kids. And, and it's, it's only the old white guys that have had some kind of life challenge or epiphany that say, I'm not going to lead like that. And that's probably what we're most proud of, of, of the book is we've actually had some of those old white guys come to us and go, this was a wake up call. Yeah. This, this, this is, this isn't just another business book. This is, me reprioritizing my leadership legacy and i'm all in and uh, and that that side pretty exciting now are we going to help the other guys that haven't had that epiphany no we're not but we're going to help we hope the next generation and and the female leaders and the people of color leaders that don't want to emulate their boomer male mentors and predecessors and business professors they want to do things different and when we're we're there to help yeah, it's very interesting because um, when I, you know, again, this is something we spoke about, you know, people think that change, change takes place because something dramatic happens and cha change doesn't take place because I, I know this personally, doesn't take place because something dramatic happens. Change takes place because something dramatic happened and then you reevaluate as opposed to something dramatic happened and then you go, well, let's get back to normal. Yeah. Right. So when I fell off the mountain, that's what I, you know, people said, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm coming back. That's bullshit. I wasn't coming back. You can't go back. There's no back. That's not how life works. It's forward. Um, and so I think that oftentimes part of the denial process is to to try and re recreate normal as it was. And so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There's going to there are many old white guys who were saying, yeah, this is this has been a wake-up call. My concern for them, and this is why I want the book to get in their hands, my, my concern for them is at an egoic level, not because they're nasty or horrible people, but we all have an ego. At an ego, no, egoic level, they're going to just go, well, you know, it's just a couple more years. I'm fine. And they're going to move into denial of that. And the next thing is not going to be a pandemic, but it's going to be a heart attack or it's going to be a stroke or it's going to be, you know, the wife is like, you know what? Dude, I haven't got that many years left. I'm out. You're yeah. gonna find somebody who actually pays attention to me because the kids don't even know who the hell you are, and the kids are gonna the kids are in university or whatever in their first child, and they don't know who you are. So I, I love the idea. For me, it's it's putting the book in the hands not just of the person who's gone through something. We've all gone through something with the pandemic, but who is on the brink of going back to normal and just like listen put this book in your hand read this book before you start driving back to that old destination because that old destination drives off a cliff that 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 has fallen away boy it really that that's a perfectly stated dov and and what we really want to do is to give leaders tools actionable approaches that can start to help them. Okay, so I'm reflecting, or I, I'm finally reflecting that, boy, these Gen Z kids are not attracted to our company like the millennials were, like boomers were 20 years ago, et cetera. So how do we, I love the leadership and loyalty piece. That takes two things. It means that you have to create a relationship <clears throat> with those followers where they feel like they're important, they're a part of the team, they are literally respected. And too many leaders don't pay any attention to what's the hiring experience like? What's the, what's the challenge people might have if you know, there's, there's a tornado? Oh my Lord, are we seeing some interesting climate change? 
uh, impacts across the globe. Wildfires here in March. Uh, it, it, our world is changing. So, yep. so we have to be able to, as leaders, create organizations that not only get crap out the door, it's beautiful crap, by the way, but it's about how are people representing what we do and how are people maybe even feeling like if somebody gave me five bucks more an hour, I wouldn't leave because this is a great place to work. I've grown so much. I love what we're doing. Well, as you can, as you can tell, we really uh, focus upon leaders. You've been trained to manage results. You know how to set goals. You may not be perfect at holding people accountable for those goals, but that's the system you've lived in for so long. And here we are saying, this isn't going to work. It's not going to work tomorrow. It's certainly not going to work in five years. You've got to change the relationship that you have, which means you've got to make people feel literally um, respected in every interaction. That's a lot of work, but that's the way you're going to create loyalty. So I, I want to address that because the, there's a subjectivity to that. Um, I think I had even talked to you about that. I work with a company and um, the founder brought me in and he said, we just don't know how to get our people to really be deeply engaged. You know, and you and I both know, you know, all of us, we know that, you know, half the work around in getting engaged staff has been a complete, like, just why don't you just burn your money? It's been a waste. Billions of, time. of dollars wasted. Billions yeah, every year. Right. So, so what it comes down to is, you know, so this guy had, you know, he built this coffee room. It was a, it was kind of the community room. There was bean bags and there was espresso machines and there was a foosball machine. And I, and, he, and I said, okay. And he said, you know, but nobody uses it. And I said, okay, of course. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, did you ask anybody? He goes, well, no, I read in these books about these places and, you know, I thought that's what I should do. And I go, Okay, so no, you never asked anybody. He goes, no. Okay, so don't you think it would have been a good idea to ask the people who might be using it whether they actually want a cappuccino machine because maybe they don't drink coffee. Who cares, right? Oh, no. All right, never thought of that. Okay, next question. How often have you used that room? I go, so I don't have time for that. I go, so let me just explain to you what leadership is in one simple word. And he goes, what's that? Permission. Right? Culture is permission, and the culture is and the culture's permission is given by the leader. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, if you're not going in the room, they think that if they go in the room, you're watching them, and it's not a good thing. Right? They're going to get their hands smacked, and it's not going to be good. So lead the way you want people to go. Don't lead and then say, oh, well, you do something else, because people are not going to do that. That brings me to, and we're going to go into it in the second half of the show, but I want to get into the the specifics because that's an example of the subjectivity yes. and so how do you how do we give respect you know we've got 10,000 employees you know across the country or across multiple countries how do we get how do we give respect when everybody's subjective understanding of respect is different and how do we not spend a fortune on just you know to use the term powdering everybody's ass <laughs> rather than actually getting the results we want to get. So how do we do that? That's where I want to go in the second half of the show. But before we do that, I really want to make sure that everybody knows where they can find out about you guys, where you can find out about the book and all of the wonderful resources you have. So Mark, tell people where they can find out about you. And then Chris, you can tell them where you can find out about you. And then we can talk about where they can find out about the book. Well, first of all, I'll tell you, Chris and I are both uh, all over social media. We're, we're two of those old white guys who jumped on the bandwagon very early, and we still run our we still run our own um, Twitter and Facebook and, and LinkedIn accounts, so you can certainly find us there. And, and of course, we'd encourage you to go to goodcomesfirst.com. And, and not just, don't just go there to buy the book, but learn a little bit more about us and, and why we wrote the book and, and why the, the book might be important to you. And and might even discover whether you're really ready to take on this, this challenge of putting good first, because it's not for everybody. Okay, very cool. So is so that's goodcomesfirst.com? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, fabulous. So we'll make sure that, that, of course, is posted in the show notes. Is there any other places, Chris, that uh, people should reach out? Again, we've we've invested so much. Boy, we started writing this book <clears throat> almost four years ago, Mark. We've got we've got such enthusiasm for these ideas. Good comes first is the best place to find us. You can you can go to our individual business sites. You can find our our social posts there. But goodcomesfirst.com is the easiest place to go. Fabulous. We'll make sure that that is posted. And for you, dear listener, remember that we'll post those uh, those show notes uh, in uh, those uh, URLs in the show notes. So you'll be able to reach out to Mark. You'll be able to reach out to Chris. You'll be able to find out about the book. And, you know, listen, if you are, even if you're not an actually an old white guy, but if you're realizing that normal is not coming back and that there's a need to do something else, I really highly recommend that you go pick up the book, Good Comes First. You can find it on Amazon, you find it on any one of the outlets that uh, will, again, we'll put a link in the show notes. But, you know, really consider that. Consider that for yourself, consider that for everybody else. That what if you decided to put good first? What if that was the beginning of the new bottom line for you and for your organization? We're gonna be back in just one click. Till then, Stay curious, my friends, stay curious, and come back for the second part of our delicious conversation with Mark Babick and with Chris Edmonds. We'll see you very soon.